Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Symposium on Advancing Equity in Higher Education on Long Island. We've had a wonderful morning of programming, and now we can look forward to even more for this afternoon. My name is Christine Fina. I'm a librarian from Stony Brook University, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm your host of presentation session B, which is the pedagogy and instruction session. Before our presentations begin, I'm going to take just a few minutes to go over some housekeeping matters. First, just a quick reminder about what happens after this session. You will have a choice of two different tracks for the 215 to 345 session. And for anyone who has questions about how that will work, I'll explain a little bit more at the end of this session. Next, just in case you aren't already familiar with the format, you will notice that you as an attendee have access to both the chat and the Q&A tool. Um, we're not gonna be using the raise hand tool, so we're gonna be using the Q&A and the chat. I'll be monitoring both, uh, but be aware that there will be a single Q&A after all three of our presenters are, of our presentations are finished uh, and not between each presentation. Throughout the session, please submit your questions for our presenters via the Q&A tool. And if you could also indicate which presenter the question is for in your question, that could be helpful. In terms of the chat, you can chat directly to panelists to get help with any technical issues. And you can also use the chat for conversation among attendees. In addition, just in case you missed this announcement from the previous sessions, we're going to use a strategy called progressive stacking. This is a technique intended to give marginalized voices a chance to speak, particularly in an environment where there is a dominant group. What this means is if you choose to self-identify as belonging to a marginalized group and you'd like to ask a question via the Q&A or make a comment in the chat, you can choose to include an asterisk at the start of your question or comment. During the Q&A, we will prioritize those questions marked with an asterisk. You're not required to self-identify, it's just an option that we're making available to attendees. That being said, we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can today. I also want to remind everyone that we are dedicated to providing a symposium experience that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. Please be respectful of presenter and attendee experiences when participating in this session. Finally, one more reminder that this session is being recorded and will be available after the presentation on the SBU Library's YouTube channel. Please be aware that chat transcripts, even private chats, will be captured by Zoom during recorded sessions. Thank you again for joining us today, and I will now turn to our presenters. We have three wonderful presentations on topics related to instruction and pedagogy. The first is by Victoria Bosher, who will present instruction strategies for diverse learners and vulnerable student populations. The second presentation is by Keith Pardini and Fabio Montella, who will present inclusion through the study of exclusion, equity in a college research course. And the third is by Jamie Hartless, who will present Google mapping inequality on Long Island. Our first speaker is Victoria Bosher, who is a Long Island public school teacher, as well as an adjunct instructor at Suffolk County Community College. Once again, the title of her presentation is Instructional Strategies for Diverse Learners and Vulnerable Student Populations. Victoria, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, can you see my slides? We cannot. Okay. All right. Is that better? I'm not sure you're sharing your screen. Okay. Let's see. Okay, how is that? Yes, we see them now. Okay, not an expert. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, this is Instructional Strategies for Diverse Learners and Vulnerable Student Populations. I'd like to start looking at some statistics from Suffolk Community College where I teach. You'll see here at fall 2015, 
we had 33.2% of incoming students in need of developmental reading. They did not have the reading skills to participate actively in college. The good news is that of that 33%, 75% became proficient in college reading, prepared to engage with uh, college content. But these are fairly vague uh, descriptors. We don't really know how our students will be able to participate with content that really challenges their reading skills. So we as instructors must be prepared with diverse strategies to reach these students. Okay, uh, this is what's called differentiation. Uh, it's how we make course content available and accessible to all learners through three different types of modifications. Uh, with content, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I will be focusing on how students access information because most of us don't really get to choose uh, what exactly we're teaching all the time necessarily. If you use videos or sample work, uh, any sort of models in your instruction, you are already differentiating. This is something you're doing. So content is one way. Process is another. It's the way uh, that students are engaging with your content through activities to learn. And uh, lastly, uh, through the product, the work product, the assignment, the assessment that the students are uh, offering up for a grade to prove that they have learned what they need to learn in your course. Okay, so uh, let's talk about delivery of content. So uh, the first thing you can do is to perform a pre-assessment of students' prior knowledge of your course content. This could be a kind of pretest for no grade uh, of actual content you will be covering or it could be a kind of questionnaire where you ask students uh, what they know about your topic. Uh, did they learn about it in high school, different college courses? Do they read about it on their own for, for pleasure reading? Uh, knowledge is power and this information can help you decide what parts of your curriculum need greater emphasis and which parts could uh, be, uh, you know, give, could be given less emphasis based on needs in other, in other uh, disciplines or subdisciplines. Another thing you can do is reframe how you introduce each classes or weeks content to your students in the syllabus or at the start of class sessions. So here, most of us use a kind of discussion topics here where we give a broad term for what we will be covering that day or that week. Phrasing this information as an inquiry question uh, is an better way to get students to engage with the content because they know explicitly or implicitly that they should be able to answer that question when they are done engaging with your content before they move on to another topic. These uh, discussion topics you see up here in the white box, uh, introduction, drafting an email, um, very broad. And when it comes to uh, the work students uh, are doing to show you their learning, their work is fairly broad. Inquiry questions focus their attention on uh, a specific uh, learning objective. Another thing you can do is to pre-teach vocabulary. You can give students the vocabulary uh, via Blackboard or in the previous class session so that they can learn it and come prepared to use that vocabulary in the next lesson. You don't want students to be encountering vocabulary and applying that vocabulary in the very same lesson. It makes it a little harder for it to work, to work with it and to engage with it. And the last thing you can do to improve delivery of content is lengthen your wait time. Wait time is the amount of time you wait after offering an open-ended question to the group. Most people, regardless whether you're teaching kindergarten or higher ed, tend to offer about three to four seconds for students to answer before they step in to try to help coerce an answer out of the group. You will get a better response if you allow about 10 seconds of wait time because your students need more time than you think to process the question, recall, and phrase into words their response. Greater wait, wait time means a more qu high quality response. Okay, let's go on to differentiating for process. Many of us use modeling in our classes and I suggest switching to a think aloud in place of modeling. 
Uh, this instructor here will explain the difference. And I'd like to listen for her language use for think aloud versus modeling. A think aloud is different than a model. And I think elementary knocks my socks off with this. Former secondary teacher, I didn't even know about these. It wasn't until I was coaching, I really appreciated the power of a think aloud. Let me explain the difference between a think aloud and a model. Because for some of us, we might be thinking we're doing a think aloud, but you're doing a model. It's not enough. If I was teaching a kid how to shoot a free throw, I could just model it. Okay, yeah, your form. Woo, we got to work on this. Let me show you. Okay, so you get to the free throw line, and this, this is a free throw. Okay, so this is what you're going to do. Got it? Okay, I'm modeling it. You getting it? Got it? Good. Your turn. So you're seeing very little use of language and it's all, it's all the modeling portion. You don't know what the, the teacher is thinking about as she's teaching this skill. Now let's see how language works in the think aloud. Okay, nothing's really gonna change about his thinking or his ability to do it. We switch that. This is the think aloud. Okay, so we're gonna learn how to shoot a free throw. So the first thing I do when I come to the line is I look down, I'm right-handed, my right foot slightly in front of my left. That's not really obvious, but that is what's happening. Here's definitely what's not obvious. I'm leaning forward, you can't see that. Let me tell you, I'm leaning forward. I'm on the balls of my feet, I'm leaning forward. Now, let me tell you where I'm looking, because you can't tell. I, no, I'm not looking at the rim. You look at the rim and you're gonna hit the rim. You don't look at the rim, you look up and over behind the rim, that's where I'm looking. All right, so I'm leaning forward, my knees are flexed. I'm looking up and over behind the rim. Now I'm just hold, just hold the ball. You don't need to spin it. You don't need to do it. Just hold the ball. All right, hold the ball. I'm looking up and over the rim. I'm looking up and over the rim. I'm leaning forward. Now here's what I'm saying to myself. I'm thinking up, 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 snap. Up, 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 snap. Up, 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 snap. That's what I'm doing. Up, 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 snap. Okay, now I want you to do this. I want you to talk me through what you're thinking as you do it. Okay, so uh, you see, whoopsie, uh, you see um, the instructor is repeating language. She's using sentence starters where she says, I'm thinking X, I'm thinking X uh, to improve retention. She's explaining what she's doing and what she's not doing. And when she turns the task over to the student, she says, let me, let's show you what you think. She, she's constantly emphasizing, making thoughts explicit as she's doing this. And you'll get a much better idea of how to perform the skill that she is teaching because you know what the expert is thinking, not what the novice is thinking. Okay, another strategy would be turn and talk. This is where students are offered a question by the instructor and they turn to one another physically turn or in a breakout group uh, and talk about the question. They discuss the question amongst themselves. The instructor can then listen around the room for uh, important uh, insights and can reiterate those to the group or the instructor can just carry on and allow learning to take place between two peers. Uh, think pair share is a similar strategy. It incorporates the wait time that we were just talking about. The instructor offers a question, an open-ended question, gives explicit time to think, just thinking independently before any discussion takes place. Then the students pair and discuss the question. And lastly, another idea would be to, for the uh, instructor of the class to offer notes they have drafted to supplement class discussions. If you're familiar with the flipped classroom model where instructors provide content outside of the classroom and students learn it there and then they come prepared to discuss, this is similar. The uh, instructor provides basic notes so that the students have a general idea of uh, how uh, the class will uh, un, uh, in, unfold, and then they will come prepared to listen to a more uh, developed set of information based on those notes. Okay. And lastly, let's talk about differentiating product. Uh, one option is a Pecha Kucha presentation. Students take 20 images that are associated with their presentation. Each one is shown for 20 seconds behind them. They are automated. So the presenter does not control them. They go on their own. And the presenter has to create uh, their verbal, the verbal part of their presentation to correspond to those images that they have no control over. It's a really fun, low stakes kind of assessment. It is uh, really good for building classroom community because it's kind of goofy and things get a little sloppy and that's okay. 
A more formal alternative would be the three minute thesis, which is where students have three minutes to present uh, the thesis or their working idea, whatever they are working on in your classroom. It's a little more formal. Uh, there's a competitive element where you can um, have students vote to elect a winner of the competition. And I won't go on too much more about that because Stony Brook is having their own three minute thesis competition and you can turn up and see it in action yourself. Another option is the portfolio reflection. We generally associate this with writing, writing assessment, but a portfolio uh, reflection could be drafted uh, in any subject matter, on any topic, on any type of assessment. All students have to do is compare their early, mid-process, and a late-process work and see how their skills and knowledge have developed from the beginning of the class to the end. And uh, lastly, regardless of what sort of product you are using to assess student uh, learning, collaboratively drafted assessment standards work better and produce better work because students are more aware of what it is that they have to produce for you, how they can show their learning versus you telling them in a, a more broad way what it is you expect of them. If it's collaborative, they made the assessment they have a better understanding of it and are better likely to produce a high quality product. Okay, so um, to conclude, uh, there are a number of strategies you can use for your diverse learners. Uh, there are more of them than you think in your classrooms. The majority of Suffolk students transferred first to Stony Brook by a huge margin and huge numbers compared uh, to other institutions and then uh, Farmingdale is second. So by supporting your, all of your learners with these diverse strategies, you will recognize that student populations and their learning needs are constantly evolving and changing. No two groups are the same. No two classes are the same. Uh, by making the purpose of your learning explicit, students can engage more deeply with it and produce deeper knowledge of your subject matter. And by increasing student ownership of their learning, you are also deepening their knowledge because they are more intimately acquainted with the process. They are inside it. It is not taking place around them. Okay, I will stop there. I will stop sharing. Thank you for your time. I know that was a lot. <laughs> I appreciate your attention very much. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria for that wonderful presentation. And just as a reminder to everyone, keep those questions coming in through the Q&A and we're gonna get to all the questions after all three presentations have been completed. Our next speakers are Keith Pardini and Fabio Montella. Keith Pardini is an instructor of library services at Suffolk County Community College. And Fabio Montella is an assistant professor of library services and an adjunct professor of history at Suffolk County Community College. The title of their presentation is Inclusion Through the Study of Exclusion, Equity in a College Research Course. Keith and Fabio. Thank you, Christine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Pardini. Uh, Fabio is going to be controlling the slide. So uh, next slide, please, Fabio. Okay, so uh, for my research class, LIB 101, the course concepts are rooted in critical pedagogy. Before students start the class, they usually act and behave towards expected Critical theory describes how there are institutional processes that mislead students. And whether it's conscious or not, students might be misled. So I encourage students to challenge the status quo and engage students in the construction of knowledge. And before they can create this new knowledge, I teach them about different elements of information literacy. Next slide, please. So one of the factors that helped refine my class is to align my teaching with the ACRL framework for information literacy. One frame in particular that stands out to me is the frame information has value. It really speaks to issues of diversity, inclusion, and inequity. And I teach students to understand the power of information and recognize their own information privilege. They begin to understand where and how they're accessing their information and how not all people have the same access to these resources. 
teaching information literacy this way, it empowers students to recognize the power structures that are in place that have allowed for a lack of diversity in information and how individuals and certain groups are underrepresented and marginalized. So one of my goals is to allow them the freedom to explore new topics and show them how to find diverse information. Next slide, please. So some of the advantages of critical pedagogy. So the research has shown this, but just anecdotally, I can see that students are more engaged in the class. The discussions are more substantial. The students are willing to participate more and the assignments are well thought out. Um, you'll notice students using critical thinking and questioning and challenging what they research. And as the class progresses, you can see students becoming empowered. And I really recognize this through the, the discussion board post as we get later into the semester. They're more confident in their responses, they interact respectfully, and they start to understand and relate to their classmates. And obviously a great goal for our students that can't be directly assessed in the classroom would be for them to extend this empathy to outside the class and bring it into their communities. Next slide, please. So what are some ways I've been able to implement the elements of information literacy, critical pedagogy and equity into my class? Students have to post frequently to our discussion board posts. And this has been especially important in the remote learning and uh, modality. Um, there have, uh, we have constructive dialogue there and criticism that we go through uh, every week. And some of the benefits is that students, they feel connected to their other students, which obviously, obviously has been uh, great in this time of quarantine and, and social distancing. And they also feel connected to the topic we're discussing and they begin to feel part of that conversation. And the goal is that they can contribute something new and present their own ideas. So the discussion board topics are always related to research and information literacy. The first week or two, the discussions are kind of mundane and straightforward. There's not a lot of back and forth between the students. And I guess that's to be expected. Everyone is sort of getting to know each other. Um, but I respond to almost every post, especially early on in the semester. I think it's important um, to challenge what they're saying. It takes time, but I try to set that tone in the beginning of the semester so students know that someone is listening and they'll have that opportunity to communicate with me and other students. For a lot of our students in this LIB class, this might be their first or second semester of college. So this is a new world that they're stepping into and it's a brand new experience for a lot of them. So it's important that they know that someone is listening, that their voices are heard and that they can be an active participant in whatever research endeavors they wish to pursue. One of our more robust topics that we discuss is fake news and misinformation. Um, this semester and the past fall semester, the class was really engaged in this topic. Um, why does it occur? How, how does this happen? And obviously with the presidential election, the pandemic, I think a lot of students wanted to have their voice heard. Um, so when we have these discussions of real world events, situations that, that they have been a part of and that they've, they've witnessed and how their experience, this is um, might challenge someone else's accounts. It's great to listen to and facilitate and it really advances that conversation. Next slide, please. So for the discussion board and for some of the assignments, I'll ask them to discuss what they're researching or why they're choosing a particular topic. Um, but for other assignments, I ask them to think about how they're going to do their research and what exactly is happening during the research process. So I'll ask questions about information privilege. What information access issues did you come across? Would a student at another college experience those same issues? And what about someone not enrolled in a school would they be able to do the same type of research? How would your research be affected if your access was restricted? And I'll also ask them to think about the time and effort that goes into research. For example, how long did it take to find these resources? Did you come across any barriers? Were you able to easily read the article? Were you denied access to a journal? Were there few or no results found? They'll get a sense that not everyone could obtain the same type or equal amounts of information and they're examining their own information privilege. And another question I'll ask is to investigate the source of the information. Who are the authors of your research? What are, what are their backgrounds? What institutions do they belong to? And who's the publisher? Uh, what is their history in regards to uh, this type of content? Next slide, please. So all these ideas and questions can put into context where this information might truly be coming from. So as students find out more about their research, I'll assist them when they start to ask, well, where else can I find information? Where are the alternative ideas out there? And how come there's nothing about this particular topic I'm looking into? And if there's nothing else to be found, I'll ask, well, what about you, the student? 
um, you should start thinking about filling in these information gaps. And I encourage our students to not just be consumers of information, but to be creators of new content and be part of the solution and that their voice matters to bring a new perspective. And I'll pass it back to Fabio who will explain more about uh, critical pedagogy and his class. Okay, thank you, Keith. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, just to piggyback a little bit off of what Keith was going, uh, I wanna really delve into critical pedagogy as this philosophy and what I really gained from it or what I learned from it. So I started to study it, get really deep into the meaning. And of course, over time, um, you start to feel like this. You're going down a rabbit hole. There's just so much information, different angles, um, which is good because uh, there are just so many layers to this. But once you find your niche and you realize how to use critical pedagogy, it, it really is a wonderful approach for your education and for your students' education as well. Uh, so let me just share some of my basic understandings, what I really pulled from uh, this philosophy. And the first thing is, I pulled that it is a teaching philosophy. And I emphasize that because um, it's not an exact science. It's gonna be a, a subjective, open to interpretation. Um, you'll find your own, own approach to this and, and with good reason. Uh, you have to know that it is rooted in critical theory. So you wanna become familiar with critical theory. Uh, it's the, a, a brief understanding of it. it. It's a social theory that's uh, it's really aimed at critiquing society and changing it. And really this is what we want to instill upon our students to take this and bring it into the outside world. Uh, we also want our students uh, to know that they should be uh, critically conscious and participate in social criticism. So once they understand this, they need to be participates, participants in it. Uh, and as educators, we need to encourage this and guide this. And I emphasize the guide portion because we do not want to hand them a blueprint and say, this is how you're going to go about uh, critiquing society and bringing about change. They're gonna to have to find their own footing. You wanna give them the foundation, you wanna encourage it, but ultimately it's gonna be their own approach. Then ultimately without critiques and without challenges, voices are being excluded, equity is being disregarded and students start to understand this just as much as the educators. So let's talk about critical pedagogy inside the library classroom. Now I also teach history at the college and I find that certain subjects, certain areas I believed, I used to believe rather, they were more conducive to critical pedagogy. History, sociology, literature, um, they just provide examples and narratives in those areas that can just lead to critique and expanded dialogue. They were just really built for that. So moving forward, I step into the library classroom and I'm thinking it's not very conducive in here, mostly because library instruction, it can be somewhat of a task-like science, it can be a series of steps, it can be very mechanical and we really want this philosophy to have them think outside the box. But lo and behold, I come to realize that the basis for all critique and examination is research. So whenever we're researching a topic and finding out more, this is where we're really starting to critique and pulling in additional voices. And this is being done inside the library classroom. So again, we're sort of encompassing this in other subjects as well. So how did I really introduce it into my own library classroom? Now, there are a lot of methods out there, a lot of approaches, some really wonderful ones. This is just my own personal experience, my example of how I did this. Uh, and I really, I gave my students a layered research project. And by layered, I mean, it wasn't just one, we build upon that and so forth and so forth. And I originally had my students pick their own research topics, but then I realized that many students pick subjects they're familiar with and tend to not really expand outside of the box. They wanna stay within that niche. So I selected a few topics uh, for them to choose from. And then I also tell them that I'm here to learn. I'm breaking down one of the most common power structures and that's the power between an educator and a student. So when I get back these research assignments, I tell my students, I'm not gonna grade you because I need to learn. You're teaching me about this topic. Don't assume that I know anything. And I let them know, don't worry so much about the citations and the structure right now, you're just filling me with information. So when I get those back, I write interesting stuff. Thank you for letting me know. But this is when I give them their second assignment and I say, thank you. But I heard this about this topic. One of my friends was telling me this. I heard this on the news or I read this in an article. Go back, research what I heard, which is an additional voice that I just brought into this conversation and tell me more about that topic. So now I'm making them think outside their box think outside their realm of information. 
So basically I want them to educate me further. You did a great job with the first essay. You educated me on the topic. Now there's additional information, additional voices that you need to educate me as the learner on. So ultimately I'm challenging them, I'm challenging them to, uh, to challenge their understanding of social information. The information that they gather that they already know, they need to know there's additional information outside of that sphere. And I want them to go out there and find it. So here are some examples from some of my students. Uh, one of the topics I gave was Christopher Columbus, the discovery of America. We all know this narrative as uh, the original narrative as Columbus being a hero, discovered America, he's glorified. And then of course, the new narrative comes out that it wasn't so much a discovery as it was a genocide. And a good amount of my students were familiar with this. They know the old narrative and the new narrative. But then I would, always, I would say something along the lines of how did these two narratives come about? Who created them? Who changed them? Who brought them to the forefront? And some students were, were great in this and they started to discover the Chicano movements that really sort of brought this narrative to the forefront, how they were the voices to bring this to the mass media. So again, it was just them thinking from an original narrative of the savior to students doing their due diligence, getting this voice out to the public. Another example that I would give was just an Ivy League school, Ivy League, Ivy League system. Write me a quick research paper, two to three pages. Tell me what it is. Pretend I know nothing about the Ivy League system. So they come back with a bunch of facts, a bunch of information very well. I said, thank you. You just educated me. But somebody was whispering in my ear something about education reform and how the Ivy League system doesn't really benefit that or might even work against it. Find out what you know about education reform. And again, educate me further. And when you think about education reform, I would tell them, I would really expand, go outside of what it is that you know or learn, keep digging, keep going in different directions. And some of the stuff they would come back, they would come back with some radical uh, innovations, some radical theories pertaining to education that might not even be in the mainstream or some might not even give a chance. Again, we're starting from Ivy League and we're ending up with radical thinking in education. And these students, even with their discussions afterwards, were providing uh, research and discussions that were just blossoming in the front of my very eyes. So I was very help, um, grateful for that rather. And I needed some sort of assessment and I chose self-assessment because I wanted them to assess how they were thinking. That was more important to me than me assessing their research. Uh, and I used a basic what, how, and why system. What did you research? Think of your first topic and how it progressed along the way. How, how did you research this? Did you use a database? Did you use the internet? Did you gather information from uh, authorities, your friends, family? How did you approach this? And then why? Why did you look here? Why did you look there? Why did you pick this subject? I mean, I'm sorry, this source over another. And more importantly, why did you proceed to the point where you did? Why did you stop when you did? Why did you not go further? Again, these are a series of questions that I would bring about and they would answer them honestly. And then once I received those self-assessments, if I see that they were thinking Critically, to me, that was just a wonderful thing. If I felt that they weren't really pushing themselves, I would really just have a one-on-one -on -one with them and say, well, why is it that you stopped here? Why did you only look in this one database and so forth? And they started to understand that the whole purpose of this is to critique and expand your knowledge through research. And that is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keith and Fabio. Keep submitting your questions and we're gonna to get to as many as we can after our third presentation. Our final speaker is Jamie Hartless, who is an assistant professor of sociology at Farmingdale State College. Jamie's presentation is titled, Google Mapping Inequality on Long Island. Thank you very much, Christine. So let's see how sharing the screen goes for me. Uh, we don't really use Zoom so much at Farmingdale. So give me a minute to orient myself and share my PowerPoint. And then I'll briefly just check uh, to make sure you're able to see it. So are you all able to see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yes, great, awesome. All right, so what I'm going to talk about today is an assignment that I developed, um, not specifically for my classes on Long Island, but that I have 
retweaked and curated in reference and tailored to my students from Long Island. And it's an assignment that's really meant to get students to think sociologically about inequality and to see the way that social inequality shapes their lives and to develop their sociological imagination because I'm a sociologist by training. So first off, I want to say a little bit about who I am, what is my relationship to Long Island, what is my relationship to academia. So I am a recent graduate of the UVA sociology program. So I'm actually not originally from Long Island. I'm a southerner born and raised, which I get the sense makes me somewhat of an anomaly <laughs> on Long Island. Oftentimes when I uh, say I'm not from around here, people seem very surprised by that. So I don't know if this is hubris or I don't know if it's initiative <laughs> to um, be one year at Long Island and think I have something to tell you about how to teach students on Long Island about inequality. But here we are. So I have been working at Farmingdale State College as an assistant professor since fall semester. Before I came to Long Island, I was working as a lecturer at the University of Dayton in Ohio. So basically I've taught in the past 10 years or so, I've been in the classroom as either a professor or a teaching assistant. I've taught at three very different kinds of schools with three very different kinds of populations in three different states. So I've taught in the South, I've taught in the Midwest, I've taught now in the Northeast, I've taught students at a private religious university, which is Dayton, as well as public universities. And I've also taught sociology to students from a variety of different social backgrounds that shape the ways that they approach the discipline and some of the challenges that they face when they approach it. So I've taught both students that would come from objectively very advantaged backgrounds and those that have significantly more structural barriers when it comes to both their ability to succeed in college more generally and their ability to access sociological thought. So the kinds of courses I teach are often very much oriented around social inequality. So the class I teach most of this year is Intro to Sociology, which is the class in which I have been using this assignment that I'm going to talk to you about today. But I also have taught specifically about Intro to LBGTQ Studies, Sex, Gender, and Sexuality, as well as general courses on inequality and methods, all of which inequality runs rather strongly through. So for those of you that are not familiar with sociology, I, I appreciate the uh, presentation right before me giving a little nod to sociology as a discipline that uh, facilitates critical pedagogy, one might say, and that certainly is its intent. So one of the missions of sociology as a discipline and what I think most sociologists are trying to develop in their classrooms is they are trying to develop their students' sociological imagination which is a term that was coined by C. Wright Mills. And here's basically what Mills meant by this. At the end of a sociology course, a student should be able to understand how their own personal biography and life story is shaped by history. How, in other words, the past and its inequities inform our present social problems. And in the process of doing this to get a better understanding of how personal troubles that a lot of us experience in our lives, like loss of a job, challenges getting into college, challenges paying off a student loan debt, even finding someone to date and marry, these kinds of personal problems may be shaped and informed by broader public issues or social problems. And one of the things that I particularly try to really get my students to take away from my courses is this idea that students really need to learn to approach inequality and poverty and issues of this nature not from their own personal individual level perspectives, but rather to understand that causes of poverty transcend individual actions and are very much shaped by broader problems of social access. So there's often a tendency that many students in our society often have to presume that things like falling into poverty are the product of individuals own bad choices. But I very much see sociology's job is to show students that oftentimes these problems are not due to individual bad choices, but due to the fact that individuals do not always have good choices to make. So 
for any of you that have dealt with inequality in your classrooms, whether it's in sociology, history, English, or what have you, I would presume many of you are aware that this is often challenging to get our students to see. And it's challenging for a variety of issues, kind of at its most basic level. It's challenging because regardless of which university I taught in or what my student population looks like, I think one thing that's been relatively consistent about my experience as a teacher is that my students often very deeply believe in individualism. They believe that individuals in America have the ability to succeed through hard work and that they are in control of their own choices and that that's what the US context is all about. In other words, they often sincerely believe in the reality of the American dream. They believe that individuals can be successful through hard work and perseverance, and that if they are not, it's a product of their own bad choices. And what's often very frustrating about this, apart from the obvious in that it's a central tenet of sociology in many ways that this is not true, it's that regardless of student positions, I've often found a lot of resistance to this idea. So in my student populations from more advantaged backgrounds, white students and or students from middle class backgrounds, second or third generation college students, for example, these students are often deeply invested in the idea that where they have ended up, their success as it were in higher education is a product of their own initiative, of their own grit and their own merit. And you would think that students from backgrounds where there's more barriers or more challenges would be aware that this is not true. However, in students populations that are a little bit less economically advantaged, for example, or some of my students of color, I've often seen a very strong belief in this in, of this mythology as well, but it comes not from a place so much of wanting to verify and validate one's own success but rather from a deep hope that they will be able through their own personal actions, such as enrolling in college to better their life chances. So sociology and understanding the sociological imagination then really matters for a variety of different reasons. One, we live in an economic context where there's a lot of economic recession, deindustrialization is taking away a lot of jobs, particularly in the working class, other social changes have made jobs more precarious, student loan debt is increasing, and of course the intersection of class and racism in America means that students of color bear the brunt of a lot of these changes. So having the tools in their wheelhouse to make sense of them and to realize that this is not really a product of their own personal choices, but broader social problems that we can mobilize to resist is a really important lesson. And it's especially important for the students that I teach at Farmingdale State College, which is a university that has a lot of students that are coming from relatively poorer families that are eligible for financial aid. Many of them are first generation. It's a more vocational oriented school. So a lot of them are enrolling in higher education in, in hopes of improving their work lives and are taking classes while they're working. And of course, even though there are many white students and white is the majority group at Farmingdale, there are a lot of other racial groups as well who would benefit from developing their sociological imagination and understanding the realities of social inequality on Long Island. So how do we help our students then in the classroom develop these skill sets? How do we show students the level of inequality that exists in their community and teach them to develop their sociological imaginations in their own lives? Well, one tool that I have developed for this is a Google mapping inequality assignment. And what this assignment basically does is allows my students to use Google Maps and compare different addresses and life at different addresses and to get a really real tangible sense of what challenges might face individuals that are living at these addresses. And so to prepare them for these kinds of conversations, I introduce my students to really important sociological theories that are explaining race and class disparities in America. 
and particularly the intersection of the two. For example, by showing them an NPR video, which I will be happy to share in the chat at the culmination of this, we'll talk through the role that contemporary, that, or sorry, that past racist housing laws play on contemporary housing patterns and how that reinforces existing inequities in education, the criminal justice system, and a variety of other social institutions. I also give them readings that really root this in Long Island as well. So they read a piece from Slate, for example, that talks about some recent Black Lives Matter protests in nearby Merrick and talks about how the history of redlining on Long Island contributes to those racist housing policies. So for example, we talk in my class about how redlining made it extremely difficult for people who lived in communities of color, particularly Black and Latino communities, to own homes, and how over time, White, it, white people fled the cities in favor of these suburban areas that were buffered from what was perceived to be the poverty and crime of the quote unquote city. And how the history of Long Island in many ways is the history of white middle class people leaving the greater New York City area and developing these suburbs that were limited with these restrictive covenants that banned, for example, people of color from residing within them and literally designing the infrastructure as we see in these low hanging bridges here to prevent public transit from getting to these suburbs and really spatializing inequality both racial and class wise in Long Island's landscape. And we can see that in our contemporary breakdowns of the racial demographics of Long Island. We see a lot of pockets of Long Island have a pretty extensive majority of white Americans. And then there's other parts of it where there's a pretty, pretty clear absence of white Americans and how this very much structures our contemporary landscape. So how do I show them this though? It's one thing to give them a video. It's one thing to, for example, give them a lecture material, but how do we actually help them see this? Well, what I've done in my classes is I give them an interactive application-based assignment that I call Google Mapping Inequality on Long Island. And what this assignment asks them to do is it asks them to compare life at two different addresses. So they pick an address from list A and they pick an address from list B and they input that address into Google Maps. And they're supposed to explore with Google Maps where are the nearest grocery stores, what kinds of hospitals exist nearby, where, what kinds of jobs might there be. They're encouraged to look at what the average cost of living in these neighborhoods is. What is the crime rate in these areas? And I, even though they don't know this, the way I select these lists is list A are the parts of Long Island that are the more affluent parts and the majority white parts of Long Island. And list B are the ones which have some of the higher poverty rates and are disproportionately concentrated or people of color are disproportionately concentrated within them. So I give them a little bit of guidance in terms of how to go about this. We do a little bit of an exercise in class where I give them an address that's not one of those and we play with it a little bit as a group. Basically, I give them an address um, that's in my neighborhood in Queens and we kind of look at like, what would it be like to live here? But what students are basically invited to reflect on is what amenities does their neighborhood have? If you didn't have a car, how far would you have to go to get uh, to those amenities? How hard, considering the property values on things like Zillow, would it be to afford housing in this area if you're a person working a minimum wage job and you're a single parent with a child? What might be some barriers that you would face? And which of those areas would it be easier for them to succeed within? And I invite them to reflect a little bit on what we can how we could make this better for people in these communities and how we can make them more accessible. So before I close, I'm running a little low on time, I see, and I want to I know we won't have time for Q&A, but um, before I end, what did I get out of this assignment? So in general, 
Compared to other assignments in the course, I really felt that this assignment in general helped students spatialize inequality. It helped them see disparities in terms of school quality, housing costs, and safety and access to amenities in ways that just lecturing about it didn't really bring home to them. It also, by taking addresses from both Queens and the city and the more suburban parts of the community, um, by doing this, we were able to kind of show how urban context versus suburban context mediates some of those challenges. And they were able to really see the implications of racial redlining policies on Long Island in their daily lives. And many of them did actually choose addresses near where they grew up. And they were able to imagine like, oh, wow, this is what my life would have been like if I had been born at a different address. And here's how my opportunities might have been different, either for better or for worse. And ultimately, what I argue it does is it enable the creation of a sociological imagination and help students really question their deeply held beliefs about the relationship between hard work and success in the US. So I'm going to let this go now and go to the question and answer, but uh, thank you for your time and I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you to all four of our presenters. Those were three really interesting presentations. I see we already have some questions that have been answered. If there's any more, keep them coming into the Q&A. Um, and I might just get us started while those are coming in. I Maybe for Jamie, I was curious actually about uh, the issue of green space and recreation, which is often cited as being important in maintaining the quality of physical, mental health. And Long Island has so many recreation areas, but access is sometimes limited based on what town you live in or what transportation you have access to. So I was just curious if green space or recreation ever came up in this Google mapping assignment, which sounds really great. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I didn't thoughtfully, actually, that's making me think I might want to revise that and add that in there because we do talk about that a little bit um, in the lecture part when we talk about healthcare disparities. We talk about, for example, the disparities on Queens, which is a more urban area compared to, say, Long Island, which might have more open spaces for leisure and exercise based activities. Um, so yeah, occasionally I think students did bring that up a little bit when they were talking about some of their Queens addresses, if my memory serves. But yeah, it's actually a really good thought to maybe consider bringing that a little bit more intentionally into the assignment. I, I appreciate that. It's a great idea. Great. And we've got lots of wonderful comments in the chat as well. Um, and Mila points out a great book entitled Laziness Does Not Exist that she's put into the chat. Um, let's see, and did any of the, I know that some of you have already provided some answers in the Q&A, did anybody want to expand on anything that they've said already typed out? I just thought I'd offer that just in case, but you can say no. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna maybe pose another question it's something that struck me kind of inspired by Victoria's presentation, but also I think that came up in the keynote this morning is just this, this balance between the infrastructure that's meant to support inclusion or, you know, I'm thinking about supporting diverse learners, uh, disability support services versus the responsibility of individuals as instructors or as members of a community to to maybe take some what might be very simple measures such as those that Victoria pointed out in her first presentation. And in doing that, it makes for a better learning experience for everyone. Uh, and I'm just curious, maybe for Victoria or really for uh, any of the four of you, how you see that balancing act between the supportive infrastructure and the responsibility of the individual uh, instructor to ensure that fewer students fall through the cracks. Maybe I'll start with Victoria. Um, I would, uh, I would put a, a little more uh, influence on the uh, connection from high school to college. Like um, I am not a first generation college student. Uh, both of my parents have graduate degrees. My grandparents uh, did not. 
did, um, my grandfathers did not graduate high school. My grandmothers did. Uh, so I did have help at home in terms of generally navigating college uh, in, in terms of the academic portion. Uh, I knew how to get help for myself. I, I knew how to you know, be there when class started. I, I knew generally how to do it, uh, but I didn't know anything about supportive infrastructure at all. I, I was a commuter. My parents were commuters. I, I did not involve myself at Stony Brook the way I, I really wish I had, but I had no information. And I really didn't have any more information in high school either. I don't remember anybody uh, spending an inordinate amount of time helping me make my schedule. I don't remember anybody asking me, you know, there's an AP version of this course. Would you like to take that? Uh, I, I, I don't remember any of this. What I do remember is my high school guidance counselor telling me about Suffolk. Oh, you're much too smart for that. Look at your grades. Uh, there is an inherent bias that starts way back in high school that certain institutions are for certain people and certain other institutions are for other people who can't make it. And if you uh, somehow work your way out of your station to uh, an institution uh, where you were not supposed to be, uh, there's really no help for you. Um, that I think is of equal importance to what goes on in the classroom. And uh, also, most uh, college instructors are not taught how to teach. They, they don't know any of this stuff. They learned to teach when they were graduate students. Somebody handed them a three inch binder full of paperwork and said, here, go with God. Uh, these undergrads, uh, learning is on you. You're gonna have to just sink or, sink or swim as we discussed earlier this morning. Uh, there's really limited help for the students and there is limited support for faculty also. Thank you. I, I, there's a few more questions that have come in. Here's one. I wish I had taken this Google mapping course. I'm not from Long Island or the US. I wonder if there's a way to do something similar for faculty staff being recruited, some sort of access to information to understand how the space they're moving into operates. I'm thinking of all the people of color we lose due to the environment in Long Island. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting point. I think like I, my brain, I think automatically kind of goes whenever I enter a new context to try to figure out what the social landscape is, because that's how I'm trained, you know, as a sociologist. But I definitely think you're absolutely right. Like, particularly if you're moving to a new location, oftentimes I think you don't get that kind of orientation as it were to kind of the realities of life you know in your in your home campus what the realities even what your student body looks like sometimes like and i think like you all if you really want to be a good instructor kind of like victoria was saying a little bit before you don't get a lot of preparation you don't get a lot of guidance you have to kind of learn to read your students read what particular things that you're saying are not translating and adapting your 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 skills accordingly um yeah I, I mean i do feel like we we really would benefit from some orientation as it were of like this is the dynamics of inequality in this particular context here is who our students are even like a map i feel like i'm still learning the map of the suny system in and of itself has its own kind of logic like victoria's kind of saying certain students are here certain students are here certain colleges have x missions i feel like we could develop some sort of training for new faculty and also kind of maybe caucuses particularly from faculty from underrepresented backgrounds whether that's people of color or lbgtq people or you know other individual groups you know kind of that we could kind of workshop particular challenges each of these groups might face that's something that I think campuses could do a little bit more actively as part of their faculty orientation regimens. Thank you, Jamie. We've got a couple more questions here. I'm going to try to squeeze them in. Uh, here's uh, one for Keith and Fabio. Do you feel like the language around pedagogy, including the word pedagogy itself, has the potential to exclude certain groups of people? Um, good question. I'm not sh so much uh, sure about the origin of the word, um, but as as times change, as you know, political events occur, as social change occurs, I think that different uh, pedagogical theories are changing, and I think it's always just very fluid. Um, 
and I think we all are trying to adapt to just the different changes and, you know, conferences and symposiums like this, I think really bring out um, different ideas that people have and, and just having this discussion really helps. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure anything else. Bob, you have anything to add? Person <clears throat> Excuse me, personally, um, when you start to consider pedagogy as a science, I think then uh, th that has a, just the wrong connotation for me. Um, anything related to education, I, I don't feel personally that it should be a science. It doesn't work A, B, and C. If there's a philosophy involved, um, you want to sort of grab that philosophy and use it, but I don't think it's so much um, the word or, or the, the words around it that, you know, sort of exclude others. I think it's the way we take it and utilize it. So if, if I'm reading about a specific uh, teaching philosophy and then I say, I'm going to use it in this manner, I need to be conscious of whether my teaching methods or my approach with that philosophy, if it's excluding um, certain groups or certain people. And again, I think that's uh, how we interpret pedagogy uh, into our particular methods. Thank you. I know we're just a couple minutes over, but I just want to get to the one last question here. And I also want to make sure everyone, in case you haven't, uh, there were some questions answered via text uh, during the presentations. And I want to make sure everyone gets to see those as well, if you haven't had a chance to look at those. One more question here for Jamie in terms of the Google, Google mapping activity. Uh, wondering how much time you focus on the inequalities in public education and how much time do you spend talking about how to address the structural inequalities and solve the problems? Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, so I, I can talk you a little bit through the logic of my syllabus because I do talk about both of those points. They kind of come at different parts of the semester. So the way I kind of organize my class is into three units in Intro to Sociology. So the first unit is kind of introducing students to the theories of sociology. So they learn what we mean when we say use the sociological imagination. And then unit two is my bigger unit. And we kind of go social institution to social institution. And we look at what the job of those institutions is supposed to be. So for education, for example, we look at what, what, what should education do? Like, what do we want education to do in society? And then we look at whether it actually does it and what sort of how inequalities prevent education from doing things like providing economic opportunities and how by looking at how schools are funded and how we get these different resource levels within schools and how that shapes these school experiences. And um, sometimes in the discussion board, my students will get really into it too, talking a little bit about like, oh man, in my school, we didn't have all these things. Or I transferred schools one semester and I went from Queens to Long Island and it was like night or day in terms of what resources I had um, at my disposal. So we, we look at each other's, um, we look at the institutions and then we end kind of by thinking about using sociology to solve social problems. And so we're gonna talk a little bit in my class this semester about social movements, uh, for example, how they emerge to develop these issues. Thank you. And I think that concludes the session. Thanks to everyone once again for attending. Thanks to our presenters. And just one more reminder uh, in terms of the next session from 2.15 to 3.45, there are gonna be two different tracks to choose from. Track one is the panel on campus partnerships uh, and the sessions on the post-college transition. And for that track, you will use the same Zoom link that you've been using throughout the symposium. For track two, which is the workshop, Freedom, the Art of Risk Through Jazz Improvisation, there's a Zoom workshop link that you all received in the email, but just in case I'm gonna slip that into the chat, that is the link for the jazz improvisation workshop starting at 2.15. Thanks to everyone. Make sure to look through these wonderful comments in the chat before you go. Take care. Also, by the way, I dropped in my links that I said I was gonna drop uh, to those resources if you'd like them, uh, the video on redlining and the article, just FYI. Oh, the, the NPR video and, mm -hmm. and the sleep. Mm. See it right there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. For moderating, Christine. Thank you. For moderating. Great job. <laughs>